Hi. Chapter 1 of our Introduction to Physical Geography book covers essentials of geography, and I'm going to cover just some of the, the main points here. Basically, geography means describing the Earth, and in this case, the features. It could be anything like physical, cultural, political, economic, or whatever. Like I said before, geography is the study of where. So who we voted for in the last election, uh, poverty rates, um, premature heart disease death rates, or whatnot, can be mapped across space and time. Now, study time is what we call history. There's also historical geographers, economic geographers, health geographers, and whatnot. So geography can be intertwined and linked with a number of other fields. You can see some examples of each like population geography versus demographics, market and geography versus just the, the study of marketing and business. And you can see some of these you know, intersections here as we look closer and closer to physical geography here, whether it's, you know, biogeography, soil geography, water source geography versus hydrology. To a cartographer and geographer, maps are a prevalent form of geographic communication. So you can see an example here Darker, higher, lighter, lower. We can color these be color these by enumeration units, such as counties right here. But they have they tend to have their own challenges, and we'll kind of talk about and address those a little bit when we look at some maps. In the United States, the U.S. geography illiteracy is is well documented in the past. Uh, there's an old study, almost 30 years old, but the U.S couldn't identify United States on a particular map, you know, in other places like, you know, like Sweden, Japan, New Zealand, uh, Middle East, or Persian Gulf in this case right here. When we talk about geography, there's five main themes of geography. One's called location, your absolute location versus your relative location. Absolute talks about your latitudes and longitudes. There's other systems to measure your absolute, uh, absolute location you know, such as northing and easting or some of your state plane coordinate systems, but we most known about latitude and longitude, which measures angular distance. We have relative location, relative to human and physical features on the landscape. So we might say, hey, this is Venezuela, where is it? You know, because if I were to tell you latitude and longitude, we, most people have little idea as to what those latitudes and longitudes represent and where they are on the face of the earth. So a lot of times we talk about relative location. All right, I live at 23 Main Street, comma, Fredericksburg, comma, Virginia. Okay, that's typically at what we call relative location. And what your phone does is turn that into an absolute location with a, a latitude and longitude on the map. We've got human geography or human environment interactions. Basically, what are all the things that people do to mess up the earth? Okay, or is environmental damage an inevitable, inevitable consequence of human settlement? So you can see something in the ocean here. Obviously, this isn't, you know, just natural there. So how is this going to affect um, future generations of people living in this area? Region. Features tend to be concentrated in particular areas. We can see great examples of this in, you know, 50 miles north of Germanic Community College in Washington, D.C., Regions, and we can see, can see perceptual regions, which are <clears throat> what we call vernacular or vague, you know, perceptions like Appalachia, where does Appalachia begin? Uh, formal, based on specific trade or functional. Place, how do we interpret space around us? Okay, how do I give directions? I don't give directions saying latitude and longitude. I say, hey, look for the McDonald's, take a right there. How do we interpret space around us? And mental maps help do that. And then movement, mobility of people, goods, ideas across the surface of the Earth. In terms of Earth systems science, um, this talks about system, you know, ordered, interrelated set of things and their attributes, flows of energy, matter. Um, we've got inputs, outputs, and then obviously impacts attached to these. So you can see you kind of the systems analysis or the system setup when we talk about um, physical geography and some of the geosystems here. Um, Spatial analysis, <clears throat> and this is kind of what I focus in, is, you know, the nature of physical space. You know, as we move across the surface of the Earth, some phenomena is going to change. In this case, what we're looking at, in, especially in physical geography, is the interaction of organisms, 
natural processes, um, you know, such as climate or weather or earthquakes or volcanoes or, or whatever. And we use the scientific method to you know, create hypotheses using um, measurable and empirical results to quantify and look at that data. Uh, the Earth systems have four major systems. We've got the atmosphere, gas around the planet, hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the biosphere. And this biosphere is, is going to be important. This is what differentiates physical geography from Earth science. And so you can see examples of these here. We have other terms like geography, geometry, geodesy. Um, cartography is the art and science of making maps, so we can look at maps and, you know, what are some of the the art part of it versus the science part of it. You know, what colors can I use? There's science that discusses that. And then the geographic grid, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that helps us measure our absolute location. We have our different geographic zones based on latitude. We've got relief. So the highest point, the lowest point, so, you know, it's about 35,000 feet below sea level up to about 29,000 feet above sea level, but given the circumference of the Earth is about 24,000 miles, that's, it's not that big. And then we have the dimensions of the Earth. The Earth technically isn't a sphere. It's what we call an oblate spheroid or a geoid, meaning that the equatorial circumference is a little bit more than the polar circumference. Kind of, you know, think of someone standing on a basketball or whatnot. So it's got this equatorial bulge. And then we've got all lines of latitude. Those are called parallels. Okay. And as we go further north or further south, the length of those parallels get longer or shorter. So with the equator, it's about 24,000 miles. And as we move further and further north, it's dependent upon the the cosine of your latitude, these lengths of these, but I don't want to freak anyone out with the, you know, uh, trig and all that other stuff. We also have meridians. Meridians meet at the poles. These are lines of longitude. And we have something called the prime meridian, which goes through zero degrees longitude, just, uh, just to the west of London, England. And so you can see the prime meridian using this particular um, projection here. and then the geographic grid. And the gradical is the intersection of your lines of latitude and your lines of longitude. So essentially we can assign unique values of latitudes and longitudes to every point across the surface of the Earth. So latitudes go from zero to 90, north and south. Quantitative geographers or GIS professionals like me, we do positive and negative. And then longitude goes from zero to 180. So positive and negative or east and west. And the east of the prime meridian is going to be positive, west of the prime meridian is going to be negative. So you can see the United States, when you think about it as a Cartesian coordinate plane, you know, which you did in math class, it's in the second quadrant. So it's, you know, positive y, negative x, but we say latitude and longitude. So you need to be aware of that. We also have time zones. They're about every 15 degrees of longitude wide. You can see the North American time zones here. So you can see this northern part of Indiana here. My wife is from this part of Indiana. It basically, this part of Indiana is included in Chicago because a lot of the people who live here actually commute to Chicago, so they're around the same time. Uh, you can see the international date line here at about 180 degrees west longitude, but you can see it kind of includes this country here called Kiribati. And then you can see parts of the Aleutian Islands, which is part of Alaska, actually goes into the Eastern Hemisphere. But you can see it's still included as you know, part of the day or part of the same time zone for the Aleutian Islands. We also have scale. So when we look at maps, we have high scale. This number right here, 1 to 25,000, is a larger number than 1 to a million, okay, if we're talking about fractions. So this high scale map basically expresses these numbers um, more detail versus less detail. We also have projections. When we put a 3D surface, like an oblate spheroid such as the Earth, onto a 2D surface, we're always going to have some sort of distortion. 
Okay, and basically these talk about this process. We have different types of projection. One is called the conic projection. So you notice here these lines of latitude and longitude aren't straight. Okay, and that's because of the, because of the projection issue. Okay, when you put a 3D surface onto a 2D surface, there's always going to be some type of distortion. Think about it when you wrap up a you know birthday or Christmas present. You're always going to have some leftover paper. You know, we just cut off and tape and fold it over, but you know, how do we address this mathematically or cartographically? It is a little bit hard. We have different types of projections here. This is a cylindrical projection, which where basically the lines of latitude and longitude meet at 90 degree angles, but it's got other problems. This is an interrupted projection, but every projection has some type of compromise. So these just kind of address the different types of projections. This is the uh, uh, cylindrical projection here that I was talking about before. This is Greenland. It's about 840,000 square miles, about three and a half times the size of Texas, but it looks to be the same t size as South America, what, when in reality it's many times smaller. Because remember, as we go further and further north, these lines of latitude should be getting smaller and smaller. But the good thing about this projection is that these lines of latitude and longitude do meet at right 90 degree angles. So up is north, down is south, right is east, left is west. We're not following along these curved lines that we saw before. We have GIS, and this is my specialty here. So it can display spatial variation, natural hazards, intensities, or, or whatnot here. Uh, this is some work that I've done with uh, the Army mapping um, tornadoes around particular Army bases. We also have something called remote sensing, collecting data from a distance. This is collected from a satellite. You can see Fort McHenry. Um, this is Inner Harbor, Baltimore. This is taken about 20 years ago. So you can see they're starting to build the, the New Raven Stadium right here. And then you can see Camden Yards right there. This is what we call the false color imagery. This isn't what our eyes see, but uh, wavelengths. And then uh, recently I, I purchased a drone. So you can see a picture of my house as I'm flying it up above my house. And I actually have attached a sensor to it to collect temperature to see what happens as we move up in the atmosphere. So there's some neat things that I can do. Um, but analysis can do something called change detection. Let's look at what hap looks look at before and after. And the good thing about drones is now you don't need to rely on satellites or even airplanes. You can do this yourself. This is Hurricane Charlie back in the uh, mid 2000s in Florida before and after. This is uh, 2004. This is the earthquake in Indonesia. This is your before picture and your after picture. And then we can do some neat things with GIS where we, if we have elevation information, we can make some cute, you know, or, or nice looking maps or renderings such as this. But with increasing technology, people all over the world can, you know, meet and talk with relative ease. You know, so this wasn't even the case, you know, a generation ago. And our perception of the world is constantly changing with human advances. You know, you can see this map here from 1494. I don't see Australia here, and you can see over, you know, South America kind of disappears, and where's the west coast of the United States? So you can see it's it's getting better and better. And then, though technically not a map, we have something called a cartogram. Okay, because it doesn't have scale. You know, this distance is different than this distance, but it shows relative location. We're going to try to map some type of phenomenon.